it's a really special pleasure to come back here um, and to have a chance to, to share with you things that I've been, I've been, I've been working on. Um, I did get my PhD here. Uh, I finished in 2000. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that you know, my professional career and everything I've accomplished uh, was because of the education and the training uh, that I got here. So you guys cannot, I mean, this, um, for me, I think I'm biased, but I think, you know, this is the home of neural engineering. You know what I mean? It's really where, where neural engineering insights are created and the foundations continue to be laid. And it's really where neural engineers um, are born. And I would include me in that. So um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be back. Um, and I have worked a lot on non-invasive uh, stimulation, but um, recently, uh, um, I've increasingly focused as well on some invasive techniques. And the talk I'm going to be giving you today is going to try to um, actually bridge mechanisms across these. You typically think of these as, even though they're all neuromodulation, you tend to think of these as pretty siloed as far as mechanisms. Uh, but um, sort of the arch of some of the research that I've become interested in uh, ends up connecting these together. These are some uh, disclosures. Uh, and and uh, my slides are already online. Uh, if you wanted to download them, uh, as are all the references. Okay, so I'll be talking about different neuromodulation uh, techniques. I don't need to introduce them uh, to this audience. You know, they span things that are invasive, that require implants. Uh, they require things that are non-invasive, but will require visits to the hospital, electroconvulsive therapy being one of them, um, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation being another. And then there are techniques that we could call wearable, where they're not necessarily wearable, but they could be because they're battery powered, and so people could theoretically be walking around while being stimulated. Uh, and I'll talk about um, an example of that. But I want to start talking specifically about deep brain stimulation. And one of the, the um, ideas that you know, others and I've also been thinking about is, is the notion of brain vascular coupling. And what you're looking at here uh, is an image from a, from a, a rat uh, of some capillaries in the brain. And what was really striking to me is that the, the uh, typical intercapillary distance uh, is about 50 microns. Right? And so you just try to think about that density, right? I mean, you're basically maybe going to fit one soma and a few processes before you get to the next capillary. And the capillaries themselves, right, have, have some width, right? So how much of the brain volume, which we like to think about as it must be all neurons, is actually incredibly densely populated uh, by these capillaries. And it's extremely well known that um, Obviously, the blood supply to the brain and, and the way um, transport between the blood supply and the brain is regulated, the blood-brain barrier is absolutely essential for survival and it is implicated in a whole range of diseases. So that the, this blood-brain barrier um, is this uh, very important um, 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 membrane uh, between the blood supply and the brain. That's essentially what, you're, what we're visualizing there. Uh, and this interaction is a bit two ways in the sense that um, neurons can activate the blood-brain barrier. So as they become active, the blood supply and transport responds to that activity. And obviously, how uh, transport is controlled across the barrier has a profound effect on neural activity. Um, and so it become interested in the idea of, of brain stimulation or neuromodulation of this unit. And the first part of it is actually very well known. It's well known that if you electrically stimulate uh, any part of the nervous system, there's going to be a vascular response. Stimulate your skin, and the most obvious thing you're going to see is redness. Um, people who study almost any kind of uh, you know, central neuromodulation have used fMRI, which is actually imaging blood flow. Right, as a surrogate to prove that, look, DBS changes fMRI, SCS changes fMRI, everything changes fMRI. But in all those cases, it's almost considered like an epiphenomenon. Right? You stimulated the neurons, and then the fact that the neurons then activated the, this, this, this vascular response, it's, it's, it's an epiphenomenon. It's secondary to the fact that electrical stimulation is really activating the neurons. And so I think a more um, um, a different way to think about it is what if the electrical stimulation was actually activating the blood-brain barrier itself, the endothelial cells that surround the blood-brain barrier, that's the mechanism of action, and then the neurons chase it. And of course, we know here that's not all of it, right? But it's, it's maybe it's, 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 it's a pathway. Um, but it's certainly not the first thing that comes to mind. Neurons are going to be um, uh, um, always considered primary. So if I were to put an electrode in the brain, I would stimulate the brain, and I would see both a neuron and a vascular response, the gut instinct would be based on all the foundations that come from 
you know, Cleveland, well, you activated the nervous system, because that's what electricity does, and then the nervous system activates the blood supply, and it'd be very hard to convince people that the opposite is true. And so the way we went about addressing it is by using a system where the brain is absent, where you only have essentially the blood-brain barrier, and obviously if you stimulate that isolated system, you see a response, you can't say it's the neuron. Now fortunately that system has been developed. There's many people who study transport and transport across the blood-brain barrier, and they've developed systems like what you're seeing here, and so there is a, a cultured monolayer of, of cells. Uh, this could be a, a, a blood barrier or a blood-brain barrier, and so these cells are cultured, and you can see here how they, 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 they form a, a tight monolayer, right? They essentially form a seal, and there's a little bit of a space between them, uh, a tight junction between them, uh, and that uh, can be maintained in a dish that looks like this, and um, you can monitor both water transport, that's what that bubble tracker is for as water moves through, uh, but also transport of different solutes of different molecules. So for example, if something is fluorescently tagged at the top, you could monitor, you could measure fluorescence on the bottom and see how much transport is happening to it. So these systems are very exhaustively uh, verified as models of the blood-brain barrier, but we can also apply electrical stimulation, and it's not hard to modify these systems to do that. Um, this, it's already a, 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 an electrolyte fluid, so you just put an electrode at the top, you put an electrode at the bottom, and you can zap right through it. And so that's what we did. Uh, and we initially applied uh, fields that we thought were relevant for deep brain stimulation. So that's where I'm going to real, and so these are fields that are approximately 100 hertz and approximately 100 volts per meter. So in this particular publication, we zapped uh, these monolayers um, and we measured water transport across them. Uh, and this is an exemplary result uh, that you could find in the paper. And so you can see, first of all, that there's, uh, prior to the period of stimulation, um, there was a steady in, uh, decrease in water transport. This is a phenomenon where they're actually, the, 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 the barrier is actually sealing. So initially when they put the cells inside this chamber and they apply a pressure, there's a process where these, these cells form these very tight junctions between them and as that process is happening, the transport is actually decreasing to some value. And we've normalized that value to one. And then uh, approximately 45 minutes into that time period, we applied stimulation for a very brief period of time for about five minutes. And then we watched what happened to the transport afterward. Now in the unstimulated case, which you can see is the open square, you can see that the, the seal essentially stays tight. The, the water transport continues to decrease a little bit more, and it stays flat. But as we apply DBS relevant electric fields, um, it's very obvious by eye that there's an increase in water transport. And again, there's no neurons involved, so we must be directly stimulating uh, the endothelial cells that are growing in the dish. So this is a demonstration that at least in principle, right, these cells are capable of responding to electricity, um, um, and that there's an increase in water transport. Um, there's a lot of other follow-up experiments that were included in, 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 this, um, in this paper, including trying to analyze exactly why there was an increase in transport. Are we, for example, electro, somehow electroporating the cells themselves, breaking them down so that water could flow through? Uh, but rather, the evidence seems to suggest that the stimulation was breaking the barriers between the cells. Right, that, that normally form this tight junction, um, and that's where, where, where um, enhanced transport was happening. Obviously, you want to ask about cell death. There's, there's work from case going back decades showing that under some conditions, electrical stimulation can irreversibly destroy the blood-brain barrier. So we were worried about that. Um, there are stains for cell death, and um, in most, ex and these, this was done afterward, the cells would be, would be stained and then removed. In most cases, even at the higher intensities, we did not see death. Um, this is an exception of an experiment where we did see cell death. Uh, we think that in, in cases where we did see cell death, that was due to some sort of electrochemical reaction that happened at the electrode that diffused up to the cells. And the data I'm showing you with the transport do not include uh, um, those examples where there was cell death. In fact, that would, that, that, those, in those cases, there'd be a massive increase uh, in permeability. So that was not included in the data that I showed you. And so we have um, DBS-relevant electric fields, DBS stimulation, 
uh, that is passing across the blood-brain barrier, and we believe that that current is actually passing between the cells, between these tight junctions, opening the tight junctions, um, therefore facilitating um, um, uh, water transport, and as I'll show you later on, also then transport of, of other molecules. And again, we don't believe this is electroporation. We sometimes call this electropermeation. We don't think it's, um, it's cell death. And there's nothing about this result that would be specific to any particular brain structure. So we think this is quite plausible in the brain. Um, um, or in the spinal cord, um, and the paper does discuss, this is a, a, like all animal models, but particularly this in vitro system, there's a lot of features about the blood-brain barrier, like astrocytes that are not present, uh, but as a proven principle, it showed that um, maybe we should not be ignoring the possibility that technologies like DBS might actually be stimulating the vascular supply, and then that, therefore, uh, neuron response will follow. Um, I want to talk more about that idea, but I want to talk about it in the, in, the, in the context of transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, which is a wearable technology. Um, just to say a few words about that. Um, I know some people here are very familiar with it. Some may not. Um, transcranial direct current stimulation, as the name implied, is a non-invasive technique. Uh, electrodes are put on the scalp, on the surface of the head, and connected to a stimulator that is sort of like it's current controlled, uh, but the voltages are comparable to 9-volt battery. There'd be about 10 volts applied, and that's going to be producing about 1 to 2 milliamps. And it's unique compared to other, in, in, in some ways, in, in, in compared to other neuromodulation techniques in that it's, no, it's not pulsed. It's not oscillated in any way, right? It's on for the whole time. Uh, and this is something you can only do non-invasively. Um, and it is a very popular technique. From the time I've started this talk to the time I've finished this talk, there'll be two more papers published in PubMed about TDCS. It is very heavily investigated for, for, for a wider region, and so perhaps some of you have heard about it. This is what TDCS looks like on my head, um, anode and cathode, positive and, and, and negative terminal. Um, I still get asked, what is the anode? You know I mean, one of the things, right? What is the anode, what is the cathode? That's something I learned here, right, in electrical stimulation, right? What is, which one is the positive and which one's the negative terminal? Um, uh, again, the, the current control is, is it's in a few milliamps, it's applied for about 20 minutes, and I was very interested whether transcranial direct current stimulation uh, might affect um, the blood-brain barrier instead of stimulating neurons directly. Now, that being said, it's well known that neurons respond to weak direct current stimulation. Um, uh, that's something that I've been studying uh, extensively uh, since, well, let me show you, since I was a PhD student here, right? So this is uh, what I used to look like uh, around 2000, and um, maybe Dominique looks more or less the same. Um, that's just one of the um, publications I had a chance to work with him on. But way back then, we were, and I, this is something I had a chance to speak about last time I was here, where weak direct current stimulation applied across the head will flow around neurons and will polarize them in a way that is uh, very well predicted and very well characterized using a wide range of experiments, uh, including brain slices where you have no vasculature. So I want to be clear that, that like DBS, TDCS can obviously affect neurons um, in an avascular way. However, uh, I was interested in, well, maybe there's this parallel mechanism where direct current stimulation could directly trigger a vascular response. And again, it's not that TDCS stimulates neurons, which then drive a vascular response that we can image with a technique like fMRI. That's well known, right? It's that, it's that if we just had the vasculature and we applied direct current stimulation, the vasculature would respond in a meaningful way, right? And that would then lead um, to, to a, a nervous response. Um, and um, we address that uh, in this publication, uh, this, this, um, using the exact same uh, experimental setup I showed you before, where there is a blood-brain barrier model uh, that, because obviously when you do TDCS in, a, in, a, in an intact animal model and you see anything, people are going to say you're stimulating neurons, right? You have to go to this isolated situation just to show that in principle you can have a direct effect uh, in the absence of neurons. So that's what we did again. Again, we're, we're, we're quantifying in, in a model, a blood-brain barrier model of, of, of endothelial cells, whether direct current stimulation applied across that barrier um, uh, can affect transport. Um, 
and we're also able to couple this to, to a computational model that I'll describe. So these are some um, exemplary results from the paper. So you can see cathode on top, cathode um, anode on top. You know, there's this mono layer, so you can you can go you can pass the current this way, or you could pass the current that way. Um, and on that left side is is the bubble displacement. That's that bubble on the bottom. Uh, but you can also um, by looking at the slope of that line, you can you can plot transport. Uh, across this uh, barrier, you can see there's an initial sealing effect, and then when we apply stimulation, we can produce a change uh, in in the water transport. And you can see it's polarity specific. So when we apply cathodal on top, right, we affect a transport one way, and we apply a nodal on the top, we affect a transport another way, right? And this could be either constructive. Um, with or antagonistic to where the flow is, is, is going on its own. Um, and this is very reproducible. This is like a trial by trial reproducible effect. We can also look at dose response. Uh, and there is a, a very strong, and oh, by the way, this effect you can see is instant and it's instantly reversible. Uh, and there's a very strong relationship between polarity and intensity and how much change in transport that we see. So you apply a certain intensity, you produce a certain amount of water transport. You double that amount of intensity, you'll produce double the amount of water transport. Um, and that's, um, again, it's, it's, it's um, statistical, but it's, it's, it's obvious by, by eye as well. So why, um, oh, and, and this enhancement in water transport was also associated with an with an with a enhancement in transport of molecules across this barrier so it's not just water that's moving there there are molecules that are coming with it uh, and we characterize this in some detail uh, and it turned out that actually larger molecules had a um, uh, bigger um, enhancement in transport than, than, than small molecules. Um, why is this happening? Well, like, like everything else, you know, it's, it's, once you know what to look for, it's expected and it's obvious, and it could be described by some well-known physical principles, in this case, something called electroosmosis. Um, and the basic principle between, behind electroosmosis is shown in this cartoon. Now, what you're looking at there are actually two endothelial cells. So these are these endothelial cells that are forming the blood-brain barrier. And I said that the little gaps between them are these little junctions or tight junctions. So we're looking at the gap between them. Uh, and these cells have, like all cells, have a negative charge on the outside of them. And so that's what you're seeing there as a, as a negative charge on, on the junctional uh, membrane. Um, and this leads to positive charges accumulating along it. And so now when we apply an electric f uh, a current across the blood-brain barrier, and that current is flowing through the junctions, right? That's how the current is, is, is getting from one side of the barrier to the other. It's flowing through the junctions. Um, it can drag these positive charges, but not the negative charges along with it. And as the positive charges get dragged, so does the water. And again, this is a very well-known, very well-characterized phenomenon. And it turns out that the tighter the junction, the stronger this effect. You would think it would almost be less strong, right? The less gaps you have, but this particular phenomenon, actually, the tighter the junction, the smaller the hole, the more water transport you're going to get per electric field. And here we're talking about, about very small um, uh, molecules as well. And though I don't have to, time to fully un un unpack it, we were able to show in this paper that as you drive water, as you drive water across these, these monolayers, it triggers a whole bunch of other secondary responses. Um, so essentially, this blood-brain barrier, these barrier, this barrier of endothelial cells, when they sense that this water is being pushed across these tight junctions, it triggers a, a whole bunch of secondary phenomenon um, that we can characterize as well. But one point I want to mention here is that we, we, what we care about, therefore, based on this idea, is the electric field across the blood-brain barrier. We don't necessarily care about the electric field in the bulk of the brain, right? What we care about is as the current passes through the blood-brain barrier, how much electric field we produce in this tight junction, if that makes sense. Because that, that, that's, that's an idea that I, I want to talk about here. And so um, what, we're, what we're currently investigating is the fact that the, the vasculature may actually be a collector of current. So typically when we're modeling current flow during any form of neuromodulation, we typically fully ignore the vasculature, right? It's not even present. And even some of the most advanced computational models we have of current flow, right? It just doesn't count. Uh, but maybe it does. And so um, I already showed you how densely, right? Those are, so this is showing macroscopic vessels, but I showed you at the macroscopic scale, right? How many vessels are, are, are present. And so the blood is actually significantly more conductive than the brain. So theoretically, it would be dragging a lot more current with it. Uh, but for the current to get from the extracellular space where we have the electrodes and the neurons into the blood, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. 
And the blood-brain barrier is actually highly resistive, right? So you would say, well, therefore, the current will not uh, use the blood as a shortcut instead of traveling through the brain. But the blood-brain barrier is also extremely thin. So though it's very resistive, there's not very much of it. And so it's almost like, well, look, you know, the current wants to take the, right, the path of least overall resistance. If it can only cross through this thin blood-brain barrier, right, and then now it can enter the brain, and now it can complete its path by essentially traveling within this massive amount of blood that's inside the brain. And we're, only st we're starting to develop uh, models to address this, but some of our initial models suggest that if you produce one volt per meter in the bulk, right, around the neurons, which is roughly what TDCS will produce, while DBS might be producing or SCS might be producing more like 100 volt per meter. But for every one volt per meter you produce in the brain, the electric field across the blood-brain barrier might be something like 700 volt per meter. And that's because it's so resistive that a very tiny amount of current flowing through it right, will produce a very high electric field. And so I think this, this adds farther, farther to the notion that maybe when we're applying stimulation to the brain, we're producing these, these very large electric fields across the blood-brain barrier, and maybe now we're activating the blood-brain barrier as a primary uh, mechanism of stimulation, not simply secondary to that. Um, OK, I'm going to just change gears a little bit. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but someone will. <laughs> Stop me when I'm done. Okay, uh, just to change gears, I wanted to introduce another uh, topic that uh, I'm very interested in that actually relates to spinal cord stimulation, and specifically, uh, which is something that, again, was invented uh, here, a case uh, in Cleveland. Um, so I want to talk about spinal cord stimulation, but a, a relatively new flavor of spinal cord stimulation, which uses kilohertz frequency stimulation. So instead of conventional spinal cord stimulation, which is at approximately 100 hertz, this is using frequencies of 10 kilohertz. Uh, and this was um, something that recently generated a tremendous amount of clinical interest, uh, but also a lot of question marks uh, because, you know, it, it sort of wasn't supposed to work. Right, based on uh, you know canonical theory that was developed in Cleveland, right, and how we think about electrical stimulation and how we model electrical stimulation, kilohertz stimulation isn't supposed to work, right? Uh, and by the way, Dan Merrill is one of the uh, people in, in that picture we saw in the beginning. Um, and so again, when you're talking about kilohertz stimulation, it's obviously well above conventional. Uh, f f frequencies. What do I mean by conventional frequencies? The ones that we think and know work, right? As opposed to the ones that, that maybe do not work. And as you make frequencies higher and higher, then obviously you have less time between pulses. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, you, you at some point have to make your pulses shorter, right? So at 10 kilohertz, right? You only have 0.1 millisecond. You only have 100 milliseconds per cycle. And you got to fit in two pulses. Right? And you've got to fit in some gap between them. And so you might be in a situation where you have uh, a 40 microsecond pulse with a 10 microsecond gap and then a 40 microsecond reversal pulse the other way. And um, everything we know about, uh, everything we, we conventionally think about as far as electrical stimulation will say that this won't work. Because the membrane is essentially a low-pass filter. It has a capacitor on it. And essentially what's going to happen is we're going to be trying to polarize it one way, but before we get anywhere, the, the, the recovery path pulse will pull it back the other way. If you took this waveform and put it through like an RC filter, you wouldn't see anything. If you put this waveform through a traditional neuron model, similarly, you, you wouldn't see anything. And that's, that's exactly what, what um, people have shown. Um, and so we took this, this waveform uh, and we stimulated brain slices. And so the brain slice is, is a, um, a technique I, I think people, this audience will be very familiar with because it's used extensively uh, here you know, in Cleveland, inc including by my um, PhD mentor, Dominique Durand. Um, and so I, I just want to briefly introduce it. This is what a brain slice looks like in a dish. It's, it's a cross section from a um, rat brain slice. It's sort of like an isolated column. I like to think of them as like single columns that have been preserved, but have otherwise been removed from the brain. It is the most, uh, maybe among the most studied systems in general in neuroscience. Right, if you're talking about oscillations or plasticity, you'll see endless rows at SFN, right, where they're using brain slice in general. Uh, and it lends itself to many forms of, 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 of characterization that would be difficult to do in an intact animal. Um, and I'll show you examples of that. And it's also used for uh, studies of electrical stimulation. In this picture here, you can see those sort of um, 
uh, brown uh, wires on the top and the bottom. Those are the wires we're actually using uh, to stimulate and to pass current across them. And this is, again, it, this is a technique that I learned uh, as a student um, in Dominique Duran's lab and, and continues to be applied in my lab. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the system, we're putting these cells inside a dish, and we are, you know, we're blasting them with 10 kilohertz stimulation to see what will happen. Um, now, before I get to that, I, I want to just highlight why we think this should not work, uh, because again, the membrane is, 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 is a low-pass filter, um, and we can characterize this by uh, applying a step response, so having the, 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 the slice sitting there in a the dish, having no field, then suddenly turning it on, leaving it on, and then turning it off, and measuring how the membrane potential of these cells changed. We can do this different ways. One way is using optical imaging with voltage-sensitive dyes. And this is what you see. So th this is imaging from a population of cells. And when we turn on the current and we turn off the current, we polarize it in a way that is, you see this sort of biphasic, one end polarizes one way, one end polarizes the other way. This is expected, but there's a time constant. And it's actually kind of slow. It surprised me how slow it was. But for some compartments like the soma, it's on the order of tens of milliseconds, not even like ones of milliseconds. It's really slow, right? And um, for intracellular recording, this was something that was known as well. So we know these cells um, are acting like low-pass filters. I mean, they're complicated. They're not linear. But in this case, they're, they're looking like a low-pass filter. Um, more recently, um, we actually recorded from axon blebs. Um, when you produce these slices, you will sort of randomly end up chopping some axons as they travel through the slice. And where you chop them, it, it forms these blebs. Uh, and it's possible to record from these individual blebs. It is an imperfect, but a model of an axon termination. Obviously, they're, they're um, um, it's, it's morphologically rather distinct, um, uh, but it's used as, as a model of, of axon terminations. And in this publication, we were able to record simultaneously from both the cell somas and these blebs, call them axon terminations of single neurons, while we apply electric fields. And what we found was that you get much stronger polarization at the terminations that you do at the soma. As you would know, right, if you've passed the qualifier here, right, you would know that terminations are going to be the most sensitive structures. Um, and we, we developed some models of it, and there were some, some things that were very expected and some things that were a bit surprising. But one of the, one of the points is that even though these have a faster time constant, it's not that fast. It's still about a millisecond. And so when you are applying uh, fields that are at 10 kilohertz, you shouldn't produce polarization. Right? Again, 10 kilohertz is actually broken up into two shorter pulses right, that fit inside that 0.1 milliseconds. You shouldn't uh, produce any polarization. Um, so for the past uh, couple of years, a student in my lab has been applying, as I mentioned, 10 kilohertz stimulation to brain slices, trying to see if something will change. And the short of the answer is, um, this work is not yet published, is she hasn't found anything. Right? We were looking at a lot of responses. We were looking at synaptic efficacy. We're looking at neuronal excitability. We're looking at oscillations. We're doing many, many, many experiments, um, at least 300 slices, where each slice may have you know, 20 different fields that were tried in it. And within every single slice, we had a positive control, which is we applied the direct current stimulation, the low frequency version. So we confirmed that every single slice responds to low frequency stimulation. And then we show that it does not respond to high frequency stimulation at the highest intensities we could possibly test. And so I don't want to really unpack this uh, too much, other than to say, when you're applying, and when you're applying 10 kilohertz stimulation to a brain slice, it's like you might as well not be stimulating. You cannot tell that you're stimulating. You see an extracellular artifact, but any kind of marker we're looking at, some, either a cellular marker or a network marker or, or, or a synaptic efficacy marker, it's like you weren't stimulating. Right? And again, this is consistent. Right? This is what you'd expect, because 10 kilohertz isn't supposed to work. Yet, right? uh, yet, 10 kilohertz stimulation apparently is working, because it's working in spinal cord stimulation. Right? And there's many people who, who are, um, and clinicians and patients, who are reporting tremendous benefit in, in their pain. It's what it's used for when doing 10 kilohertz stimulation. And so even though we see no effect of 10 kilohertz stimulation on brain slice, um, I'm not comfortable saying, well, therefore, this should never be used right, as, a, as an intervention, because obviously it is. Right? And so, and so there's, there's clearly something missing. Um, 
even though, again, we expect it to find nothing at 10 kilohertz. Um, and again, all the results I'm showing you uh, were from brain slice, and so they're, they're limited by the, the, the limitations of that animal model, which inc incidentally is avascular. Right, that when you cut the brain slice, there is no more blood vessels flowing through it. That's one point. The other thing is we put it in this temperature-controlled bath, so the slice is in this big water bath, and the temperature is controlled by, by the water bath. And so we're looking for other mechanisms of kilohertz stimulation, um, something that perhaps maybe is simply not present in the brain slice. Um, and the idea we came up with, uh, in short, is that it was heating. Right? So as you uh, make these, as you increase the frequency, right, the duty cycle starts to go up, right? So if you, let's say, increase the frequency by tenfold, you don't make the pulses tenfold shorter. You might make them half as short, right? And so you, as you go to higher frequencies, the duty cycle is also increasing. And as you increase the duty cycle, the power, right, that you're putting into the device is also increasing. If you're looking at something like a 10 kilohertz frequency with 40, 10, 40, it's almost like it's, it's on more than it's off. Right? The time that you're actually passing current, you're approaching 100% duty cycle. And it's actually well known for people who have these 10 kilohertz stimulators that their batteries all right, of the IPGs, of the programmers, are, are always running down very quickly. They have to, that's why people tend not to like to go to higher frequencies. It drains the, patter, the batteries much faster. Now, where that, where's that power going? It's not that the processor on the IPG needs more power right, at a higher clock. All that power that's being drained from that battery, so they need to constantly recharge it, is being pumped into the body. Right? And so the, 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 the hypothesis we address with these publications is, well, if you're pumping some extra power into this closed system of the spinal cord, so the, um, the spinal cord stimulation electrodes are put into the epidural space, uh, and then you have cerebral spinal fluid, and then you have the spinal cord itself, and then there's bone and other tissues around it. So as you're, as you're pumping all this energy from the IPG into the spinal cord stimulation leads, maybe you're producing some heating. Just like if you had a resistor and you put enough current across that resistor, you know, that resistor would heat up, right? And so we, we address this, we use different techniques, we used phantoms and we used models. Let me show you some of those results. Um, so this is a phantom that we developed, uh, you know, essentially jelly. Uh, and we can control the electrical conductivity of the jelly. That's easy. That you control by how much salt you put into it. But we can also control the thermal conductivity of the jelly. That's a little bit harder. So we have electrical now and we have thermal conductivity. Uh, we take a spinal cord stimulation lead. We put it into the jelly. This is a homogenous phantom at this point, And we stimulate. And then we have a temperature probe, which is optical based because we, we want to avoid artifacts right next to the SCS lead. And the prediction is, well, will it, we're pumping all this current from the SCS lead into the phantom, right? As that current flows through the phantom, will it heat the phantom? And the results of the experiments are shown um, here. Um, so what we're doing here is we're varying the stimulation frequency, going all the way from 100 hertz to um, 20 kilohertz, this is the kind of temperature rise we see. And the first thing you'll notice is that it is flat across temperature. Uh, and this is, by the way, all sinusoidal stimulation. Now, this is exactly what you'd expect based on heating, because the RMS, the amount of power in a sinusoid, doesn't matter with its frequency. So you could be at 0.01 hertz and 10 megahertz. The power is theoretically the same. So this, this, this frequency independence is exactly what we'd expect if it was a heating-based mechanism. The other thing is that the composition of the phantom had a huge effect on how much temperature rise we saw. The more um, electrically resistive it is, the more temperature rise we saw. Also, the more thermally resistive it is, the more temperature rise we saw. And this is consistent. So at one level, this wasn't. Um, this result wasn't a big shocker. Um, we can also, instead of just applying sine waves, we can apply square waves. Uh, and we can also apply spinal cord stimulation, these 10 kilohertz waves, this 40, 10, 10, 40 wave. And here, I'm showing you what happens when you match the peak current intensity across them. And you can see that these, at, for example, at 7 milliamp, uh, the sine wave produced um, around half a degree increase around the lead, while the square wave produced more. Uh, and the SAS wave produced almost as much. Now, why is there a difference here, even though they have the same peak? Well, they have a different RMS, right? The square wave is 100% duty cycle. It's on all the time. It's either up or it's down, but it's always on, 
right? Uh, while the, the, the sine wave you know, has an RMS that's typically around like 0.7 of the peak, if you remember that you know, from signals or circuits. And if you look here at the SCS waveform, wow, it's almost like the square wave, right? Because the duty cycle is almost, right? It's almost, al almost on. And if we replot this, where we normalize it to RMS, we see that for the same RMS, it doesn't matter what waveform you use, right? So if you're using a sine wave or a pulse wave or a square wave, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the RMS. The frequency doesn't matter. Nothing about the waveform matters uh, except for the, 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 the RMS, uh, which is related to the peak. This is for um, a, a symmetrical biphasic square wave. It's, it's simply related to the square root of the, of the, of the duty cycle. So you know, if, the, if the duty cycle was 100%, it would just be the, the, the peak. OK, so what does that do? Tell us about the spinal cord. Well, for that, we have to develop a, we developed a bioheat model of the spinal cord. As part of that effort, we've also developed a more general use um, model of the spinal cord. We, we, um, uh, this is uh, in collaboration with Scott Lemka's lab. This is uh, a open source, openly available uh, CAD and mesh of, of a spinal cord stimulation model that we are constantly refining that we think includes a lot of sort of state-of-the-art uh, precision uh, and detail, including, for example, explicit representation of at least the macroscopic vessels and other ganglia. And again, this is for unrelated to heating can be used for spinal cord stimulation, stimulation in general. And we're very, again, it's, anybody can download it online, but we're also excited for people who have uh, feedback for us how we can continue to enhance it. But in any case, we, we, we took this model and we stimulated, we simulated spinal cord stimulation with kilohertz frequencies. The simulation predicted the electric field, as all models do, but it also predicted heating uh, using, a, you know, using um, a, a bioheat model. And so for that case, we didn't just need to tell the model the electrical conductivity of each one of the tissues, fat, CSF, and so on. We also had to tell the model the thermal conductivity of each one of these tissues. Also, some of the tissues have, have are um, uh, metabolically active. Some of the tissues have perfusion in them. And so we had to give the model those values as well. Uh, and this is, this is obviously solved numerically. And, and we get predictions of how much the temperature will increase. Uh, it's, it's a simulation, of course, how much the temperature will increase in a person getting 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. And the predictions were about half a degree. And I'll show you more about that. Something else which, was, which really surprised me, so we were running these very large, very complicated computational models, and we started to do parameter, parameter analysis, right? If we double the electrical conductivity of the gray matter, how much would it matter? If we half the perfusion in the white matter, how much would it matter, right? Because you want to know how sensitive your predictions are to your model parameters. And so we would be varying stimulation intensity and looking at temperature rise under a whole variety of, of conditions and again, for, for reasons that maybe I still don't fully understand, as we kept running these simulations, we started to see a, a relationship that was, was very well described by a power law. Or another way to think about it is if, if I plot the log of the RMS and temperature on a log scale, it kept looking like a straight line. So here's, temp, here's the RMS increasing. And here's the temperature increasing uh, based on, uh, again, different kind of model assumptions. All, everything up here is a passive model, so no blood flow, no metabolism. Everything is an active model. And so the, the intercept will change, and the slope of these lines will change. But again and again, uh, it was well fit uh, by this simple equation. So if you know A and B, right, I can, and you just give me the RMS, I can tell you how much temperature rose in a, different, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a given compartment. Now, you have to know A and B, and A and B are a function of uh, you know, the electrode spacing, the electrode size, the pro properties of all the different tissues. And so it was not at all trivial to me that it kept looking, I mean, obviously not always, but it, it often followed this, this, this very um, well-predicted relationship. And as part of this analysis, we, we discovered that the tissue that by far mattered the most was the fat. Now, the fat is uh, very resistive. It's very electrically resistive. It's also very thermally resistive, right? And that's why it's a good insulator, right, to begin with. So it's exceptionally so. It's also not very well vascularized, at least not in the epidural space. There's not a blood flow. And I mentioned that when the spinal cord lead is in installed into the body, it's inserted into the epidural space, and so it's wrapped by this highly electrically resistive fat, which is going to produce very large electric fields right, in the fat, right, which normally maybe you wouldn't care about, because who cares about stimulating the fat? But these electric fields are going to lead to a lot of heating. 
right? And that heating is going to accumulate in the fat. And so our, our, our analysis suggested that most of the heating you see in the spinal cord itself, in the grain white matter of the spinal cord, was actually generated in the epidural fat. That's where you produce the heating, right? And then that was conducted to the spinal cord. Not all of it, but that's, that's what this kind of sensitivity analysis showed us. And so um, this is actually my last slide. And so, um, there's a lot more lessons that I think were learned uh, um, that I can reference to in these publications, but basically uh, when you do kilohertz SCS, uh, you have dramatically increased the, the amount of power that you're dumping into the body and through the well-known phenomenon of joule heat, which is that when current flows through resistive media, it will heat it up. Uh, we think that kilohertz SCS will also heat the body. Uh, and actually, we've also done some calculations where we, where we can, uh, there's data on how fast these, these IPGs deplete, right? And it turns out that it's that the amount of power that you're dumping into the body is very well predicted by the depletion rate. So we think that the fact that these batteries are depleting faster is truly because they're putting all that heat uh, into the body. And if this is the case, then it turns out that nothing about waveform matters but RMS. So all the things we typically obsess about, Right, and it, as it was established again here, right, about waveform, interpulse duration, pulse width, all that doesn't really matter. Might as well use megahertz stimulation because it has the same thing. Could use noise. It has all the waveform information based on a temperature-based hypothesis. Does not matter for optimization. Now, the temperature rises we're seeing, of course, it varies. Depends on the assumptions that you make. Uh, but I think under very conservative assumptions, um, they can be approximately half a degree for what's currently conventionally used. And while that may not seem a lot, uh, sustained over hours days, weeks, right, months, um, there's certainly evidence that that can and will affect physiology. Um, there's a lot we didn't model that we still do need to model. And again, I, 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 um, we have not established a direct link, right, between heating and pain control, for example. That's something that we're working on. All I'm showing you here is that kilohertz SES, right, can heat the body. And if it does heat the body, right, then maybe that is a mechanism of action, separate from conventional stimulation. And maybe we want an alternative explanation because the 10 kilohertz doesn't seem to be working using the conventional mechanism, right? So we're drawn, maybe this is an unusual hypothesis, but maybe we're still drawn to it because the conventional one uh, doesn't seem to be working. And there's other forms of SES I think this is relevant for as well. Some of them are called high density SES. And uh, when clinicians are using this term, they really mean the pulses are begin becoming more and more dense. So it doesn't necessarily have to be kilohertz stimulation. Um, it could be, for example, a uh, lower frequency frequency, but with higher pulse duration or higher amplitudes uh, that would also start to produce significant heating. Um, we've actually um, recorded the output of, of clinical IPGs as they've used, and it turns out, uh, that's in this publication, that the, that the physical limitations of the IPGs matter. For example, these IPGs have a voltage compliance. There's a certain voltage that they won't exceed. Um, this ends up being actually a very good limiter on the maximum temperature rise you can produce. So, for example, as the resistivity around the lead increases, for a given current, you're going to need more voltage and more voltage and more voltage. And theoretically, you could be putting in more and more and more power. But because these IPGs have a voltage compliance, as soon as you hit that voltage limit, you're capped at how much heat you can put in. So it's almost like a unintentional or you know, safety mechanism. And there's been recent pilot work suggesting that you can do deep brain stimulation with kilohertz. Uh, this is from uh, Lozano's group. Um, so they essentially connected this kilohertz IPG that's used for spinal cord stimulation to a DBS lead, right? Uh, and what they found clinically uh, was there seemed to be some, some promise uh, as far as efficacy as well as some promise of, uh, as regard to um, limiting side effects. And this is a very early clinical work that they're following up on. But of course, for us, this was very low hanging fruit. And so we analyzed this in the context of our bioheat models as well. No surprise when you'd put that much power into a DBS lead, which actually has smaller contacts. And then an SES lead, and that's really important for heating. You can produce temperature rise. Um, but it's subject, again, to modeling assumptions. For example, the, the, the properties of the encapsulation layer tend to be very critical. The more resistive the encapsulation layer is thermically and electrically, uh, the more temperature rise you would get. It has, it has a very profound effect on it. So those are th still things that we need to unpack. OK. Um, so I guess my goal was to, to explain to you um, some of my lab's thinking on blood-brain barrier stimulation as heating as it applies to these techniques. 
uh, in isolation, but also trying to sh kind of maybe show you how lessons from one may actually be applying to the other in ways maybe that I didn't fully unpack, but were, th that maybe were, were hinted at. So thank you for your attention. Hi, um, how large of a region are you heating approximately when you're doing this? Um, so, uh, for example, how deep does the current go, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and maybe that is, um, it's, somewhat, it's somewhat hinted here, maybe it's, it's, it's clearer in the paper, but obviously we're, we're interested in two things. We're interested in the heating immediately around the lead in the epidural space, and we're interested in the heating at the spinal cord itself. And so we're reporting both values. The heating you see in the, um, what I mentioned about half a degree, uh, that would be what our, our, our prediction of what you might see at the spinal cord. While at the lead, at the, around the lead in the epidural space, you could be seeing a degree, even a degree and a half. And so the models allow us to, to address it. So we, we, you do get some heating at the level of the spinal cord, Again, these are what the these are the kind of predictions that the models are are giving us. And generally speaking, where you see electric field, you will see heating, right? Because the electric field is, is what's driving the heating. So here's electric field, and there's and there's temperature, um, and maybe a little bit hard to see in this figure, but you know, where you have electric field is where you where, where you where you have temperature. And if I fully addressed your question, so we do think we predict that you do get heating at the spinal cord itself some level, yeah. And that, that, by the way, is a test that we have not tested it, but that is, that is a testable prediction, right? That's a directly testable prediction in, in the right animal model. So, so like, with your barrier model, do you have an idea of what the temperature effect would be on the endothelial cells when you put current through them? Yeah, and that's a great question, because it kind of gets into, you know, there's the right model for the right job, right? Um, and so um, if you talk about you know, this kind of model here. Oh. Uh, if you talk about the model we have of the blood-brain barrier, or even the brain slice model, by the way, I think this is a very bad model for temperature rise, right? Because we have the tissue surrounded by a fluid. The fluid is, is flowing. We are temperature regulating that fluid, right? And so essentially we've created a system where we have um, incubated out any possible you know, stimulation-induced temperature rises. And the same thing would be in the case of the blood-brain barrier. So the, 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 the cells are surrounded by very large fluid, and that fluid is, is very conductive. Um, and so if I wanted to test the effects of temperature on the blood-brain barrier, what I would do is I'd probably just take that this system or that system, and I would just heat it by half a degree and, and, see, and see what happened, rather than try to use electrical stimulation in this case to produce the heating. So again, heating, heating, heating in this system and in the other system w w w would be absent. Is that, yeah. Are you prepared to speculate at all about the mechanisms of heating with regard to pain control and? I am prepared to speculate. <laughs> because I, uh, <laughs> I am. Um, um, so it, it, you know, I, I just mentioned this example that you know you could you could heat this brain slice, right? I mean, if if, if wanted to know the effect of temperature directly, one way I could do that is it could, is I could heat it directly. And so it turns out that there are labs um, that, for other reasons, have studied the effects of temperature on spinal cord stimulation circuits, uh, including a, a um, including one lab that that's in. Um, uh, Australia. I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on the name, but uh, they've shared with us their data. And so this lab has taken actually spinal cord slices, put them in a dish, recorded from uh, specific neurons in the spinal cord, and then heated it moderately. And this is one of some of the results that they reported, completely separate from our work. They recorded from two types of interneurons in the um, dorsal part of the spinal cord, uh, excitatory ones and inhibitory ones, which both converge onto the um, wide dynamic range neurons. And what they found was something peculiar. They found that when they increased uh, temperature, the activity of the inhibitory type interneurons uh, went up. 
while the, while the activity of the um, excitatory type interneurons went down. And they unpacked this in a lot of detail. They, they identified a specific ion channel that is expressed differentially in these two types of interneurons that explain this differential response to stimulation. So again, heating, inhibitory interneurons fire more, exciting interneurons fire less, right? And this is converging onto your wide dynamic range neurons. So now the wide dynamic range neurons are under heating conditions are getting more inhibition and less excitation. Uh, and so these wide dynamic range neurons um, are being inhibited, right? And the inhibition of wide dynamic range neurons is interesting because if you talk about classic theories about spinal cord stimulation and gait theory, that's the idea, right? That you're stimulating, in that case, it's a different mechanism. In that case, it's the, the mechanism would be that you're stimulating these, these, um, these axons that have afferents that then will activate the inhibitory neurons that will then activate the wide dynamic range neurons. Now with conventional stimulation, paresthesia is par for the course. Because if you are stimulating right, these, these ascending axons, to, the, so you're stimulating these ascending axons that produce the paresthesia, and then you're stimulating the collaterals that activate the interneurons. right? So you can't activate the interneurons without producing paresthesia. But in the temperature-based hypothesis, you don't need to activate these guys. We're just producing a, a, a mild warming, which is making the interneurons fire more. So you don't need paresthesia. And the reason why everyone got so excited about 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation, right? Why a company became a billion dollar company and disrupted the whole field uh, related to 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation is that it doesn't produce paresthesia. So we think the, hypo the hypothesis that we're developing, which I'll admit is like, you know, connecting puzzle pieces from different puzzles right now, uh, is that the heating uh, is activating these, uh, making these inhibitory interneurons fire more, which is suppressing wide dynamic range neurons, which will inhibit pain without producing paresthesia. And that does tie into the clinical mechanisms. That being said, it's a big, every single physical, biophysical phenomenon is affected the temperature. So I, I could have drawn a hundred other lines, right? Because nothing is not affected by temperature. But I do like that particular line of reasoning because it ties very much into what is sort of like a con existing canonical hypothesis for conventional SES. But I think there's a lot, a lot more that could be going on. Do you have any thoughts about this company in Taiwan that's doing 500 kilohertz stimulation? Geim Geimer, do you know anything about this? No, it's one of those things where I'm watching. So that makes, so as I mentioned before, if it's, if it's heating based, 500 kilohertz, one megahertz. I mean, you get to some other physics as far as how, how the tissue responds, but it shouldn't matter. And so yes, my prediction, if it's a temperature based hypothesis, you should be able to go to ultra high frequencies uh, and produce identical outcomes. And so that's why I've been closely I don't have much. I don't have any. I don't have any insight about what that company has been doing, other than what I could see online. But you you identified why I'm interested in their work. I don't know if you are aware of what kind of results they're seeing or what they're suggesting is a mechanism. Nope. Yeah, and my other question is, I mean, why, why did they even try that frequency at one? You know what I mean? I why was I mean I think <laughs> that could be one reason. Right. Okay, okay. More is more, right? It sounds good to a clinician. <laughs> All right. So if it's heat, why not apply heat? Yeah. Little little like really little way. electrodes that just do heat. I agree. I mean, I, I 100% agree. If it's a heating-based mechanism, then theoretically you could put in some sort of element. You, you, don't, you don't actually have to pass current into the tissue. You could theoretically put current down the lead, pass it through a resistive element, produce local heating, and then draw the current up, or, or use some other light-based, I know some other form of heat. So if it is heat, if the heat is the mechanism of action, then you're correct. It opens the, it suggests that there could be completely different ways to do um, neuromodulation. So, and, and so may, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you 100% that, it, 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 that, that would be a prediction. You showed a polarity difference on the flow across the membrane. Yes. Um, and you said it's w with the anode on top versus on the bottom of the cells. Is there an asymmetry to the cells, or is that just strictly a pressure differential? And what if there were no pressure differential? Um, there is a pressure differential. The pressure on high, up, up high is higher than below. It is that pressure differential that causes them to form the seal. 
uh, that drives them to form it. Um, to my understanding, the, the cells other than that are not necessarily asymmetric, right? There's nothing about their top surface that's different than their bottom surface. Um, uh, and and uh, though I, I could be wrong, but if that, that, that idea is consistent still with the notion that it's electroosmosis. So the fact that anode and cathode are different, it's not, the cells themselves have, are just a circular blob, it's not going to respond differently. Um, because of some sort of you know, asymmetrical whatever um, expression of some membrane protein or something. It's, it's, it's the current flow that's driving it. Um, in the, but I also said this is a very, there's many aspects of this model that are, are, are very divorced from the case of what's going on in our own brains, where I, 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 I would assume that these, that these barriers are very sort of polarized. And what these cells express on the blood side is not at all like what they're expressing on the brain side. And there's many other cells that are forming this barrier. And so that's why I want to emphasize that you know, what we're seeing here is, an, is, in a, is, a, is a very reductionist. It's really so a very done reductionist. It with, without a pressure differential? So if you don't apply the pressure, pressure differential, the cells won't seal, and you'll have um, you'll have a, we haven't, the, quite, we haven't, quite possibly the effects that we see, it'd be a question of, you know, are, are the, are the effects that we see with direct current, are they so small that without that ceiling, we wouldn't be able to make much of a change. But that's actually a very good idea. The, the predict, because electrosmosis is dependent on the, on the existence of these very tight junctions, you're correct. If, if the tight junctions were not there, we shouldn't be able to produce the, the, um, the electrosmosis. What we have done, or what my colleagues Tarbell and his lab have done, is they've moved to other blood-brain barrier models using different cell types. Some of these cell types form tighter junctions. Uh, so they're more analogous to sort of the blood-brain barrier. So the, the gaps are smaller, and they're more resistive. Uh, and early evidence suggests that we're seeing more electrosmosis right, in these, tighter, in these tighter models. The other thing that makes me think that it is electroosmosis is, uh, and that's included in this publication, is again, there, there's, a, there's a model of electroosmosis. And so we could take things we know, like the height of the uh, channel between the cells, the width of the channel, um, the charges on the surface, and we can plug that into a model to predict how much water transport we think we should see were it electroosmosis. And um, at first pass, uh, we found a really nice match with the data. And so I think. I think at least in this model system, electroosmosis is a low-hanging fruit. What that means for TDCS, DBS, where now you'd be producing sort of a back and forth electroosmosis, I think there's a lot more to unpack there. Okay, so do you know what's going on with the ionic composition inside and outside of the cell due to this electric osmotic effect? I'm thinking it's a good question. So the, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I um, generally you don't want to violate electroneutrality, right? So generally you don't want to have a situation where you have more positive ions in one place than a negative ion, right? So we're thinking if a positive ion goes through, it's going to keep going, right? It's going to, It's not going to. It's not sort of. So in that sense, uh, but is it possible that as we do this, we 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 don't violate electroneutrality, but we change the balance of ions? It might be possible, right? As we're pushing water across, in the in, not in not in this not in this system, but in the brain, uh, what's in the blood is very much not like what's in the in the in the. Um, it, what's not what's in the blood is very much what what's not like. It's not what is not what's in the brain. Right? And I think the osmolarities are the same, but the ionic composition may be very different. The amount of sodium, the amount of potassium might be very different. So you're right. If we start putting, pushing water through the blood-brain barrier and we're carrying ions with it, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me that we could produce, a, a at the brain side, an um, extracellular ionic change potassium change, sodium change, and I guess what you're suggesting is obviously then that's going to, affect, that's going to be another way to affect the neurons. So um, it's a good point. I need to think more about it. Thank you very much. Well, Thanks. Thank you so much. Great. And I'm going to say one more thing. If, if you're a student here, then you're really lucky. <laughs> I just want to say, I don't know if some of you are here are students here. You are in the best place. 
I think by far um, to kind of, you know, get your chops in neural engineering. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>